Yeah, thank you uh, so much for having me. I, I really wish I could be there in person, but um, it's wonderful we have technology to allow us to connect. And um, apologies for speaking in English. I live in Paris, as, as you may know. It's been a struggle enough for me to learn French. As you can tell, I'm not French. Uh, you could probably guess that from my accent. I grew up on the West Coast of the United States, and um, so, but I love I love living in Europe and uh, working in Europe. So it, it's a pleasure to be with you. So I'm going to share uh, my screen with you uh, with with you briefly. Um, and what I'm really excited to talk to you about is this new work, the upside of uncertainty. Um, you can find out more about it, like everything I've said at uh, the website uncertaintypossibility.com. And I'm going to shamelessly call to action to pre-order it. Uh, I actually looked up it on uh, Amazon Italia. It's actually a remarkably cheap price. It's the cheapest place you can get it in the world, actually, I think, uh, to pre-order it. Um, and but, uh, but I'll share with you the ideas. So uh, a little bit about myself. So I started my career in industry. So I worked inside of real companies before going back to Stanford to do my PhD. And there I wanted to understand this question, how do companies innovate? And since that time, I've written a number of books about how established companies innovate. How do they get ideas? How do they test ideas? How do they win support for their ideas? Um, the book that's forthcoming, The Upside of Uncertainty, is a little different in terms of its focus, but it comes out of all that work with innovators, as, as I'll explain. But I also do work on technology strategy. So how is it that how, how does it that technology changes the world we live in? And uh, I help lead uh, you know our digital transformation, uh, some of our digital transformation research at INSEAD. Maybe my big claim to fame is that the founders of Instagram were my students when I was at Stanford. I used to love them. But what you should know is that I have four children, and they're all teenagers. And so now my kids are glued to their phones all day long and I curse the founders of Instagram all the time because they've turned me into this uh, parent who's saying, get off your phone all the time. So you can blame me for uh, your kids being on their phones. So I I'm excited to talk to you today. So some of the work I flashed earlier, some of the books like The Innovator's Method, what we were trying to do there is integrate design thinking with the lean startup and agile methodology, say what do they have in common, how to establish companies, apply them. But where I'm going to push us today is a little broader uh, uh, umbrella. And it's this broader umbrella, not just of design thinking, but design sciences. And, and what does that mean? Well, the natural sciences is what I was trained in, which is you describe the world and its causal mechanisms. You say A causes B, and I run a hypothesis test. But increasingly, we're starting to get interested in design more broadly as a science, and that is more what an engineer does, which is how do I design a tool to deal with the situation? So for example, in my picture here, I need to cross this chasm. How do I design a bridge so that people can drive across the chasm? And so today, I'm going to speak very much from that design science lens. How do we design tools to help people navigate uncertainty? And what do I mean by uncertainty? There's a lot of words flying out there. Complexity, uncertainty, ambiguity, risk. I'm For the purposes of our conversation, I'm going to lump ambiguity and uncertainty together. But I want to differentiate it from risk. So Frank Knight was an economist. He wrote about this and he said there's a big difference between risk and uncertainty. Risk is where you know the variables involved. You, you even know maybe the probability distribution. You just don't know what result you'll get. So think about like rolling dice. If you roll two dice, you know you're going to get a number between two and 12. And you even know your chances of rolling a seven, right? But uncertainty is different. Uncertainty, you may not know what the probability is. You may not even know what the variables are. You might not even have the mental models to think about it. And the reason why I want to talk to you about uncertainty is that it's something that is pervading our modern world. 
So this is a uh, the World Uncertainty Index is created by an economist at Stanford and um, some other folks at the World um, uh, World Bank, and they're only tracking economic and political uncertainty. And what you see is over decades an upward trend in the uncertainty that we face in the world. That doesn't include all the other sources of uncertainty. And for me, the big dilemma here, the big challenge is that we're, as leaders, as organizations, and as individuals, we're facing more uncertainty, but we aren't taught how to deal with uncertainty. Now, maybe you had better parents than I did, and congratulations, you can tell me what they taught you, but I certainly wasn't taught by my parents how to deal with uncertainty, and I wasn't taught that way in school. I was sat in rows, I was told to memorize content, I was told to plan my life and execute it, but as we all know, none of our lives turned out like the plan, right? And uh, the challenge is if we don't have the skills, the tools to face uncertainty, then we're more likely to fall into traps, to uh, be, to grasp at premature certainty, to ruminate over what we did wrong, to have anxiety about what might happen, to misinvent ourselves, to become rigid in the face of threat. These are all well-known uh, things that people fall into, well-established in the psychology and organizational literature. And, but, and the challenge at the root of it is we're wired to be afraid of uncertainty. We're, my friend who co-author is an applied neuroscientist, you, you can see the brain light up, we're afraid of uncertainty. But the challenge is that we face uncertainty. Anytime you want to do something new, you're going to face uncertainty. You're going to have to step into the unknown to do something new. And when you talk to entrepreneurs, the way they describe that experience is very consistent. They describe it like riding a roller coaster with incredible highs and lows. And, and that to, to capture the opportunity, they have to be able to, to deal with that. And by the way, it's not just the uncertainties we choose that we need to be better at facing, it's also those we don't choose. And I think globally, we share a common experience of having been hit by this unplanned uncertainty and having of, of the COVID pandemic and having to deal with that emotion and the action that's required. Here's the good news. There's empirical evidence that people do learn to face uncertainty. This is something people learn. Of course, part of it is genetics and some of us are born better than others, but the research clearly identifies some people also learn it and those who do are more creative, they're better entrepreneurs, they're better managers, they're better at making strategy, they're better at navigating unstructured environments and they're more adaptive. Wow, that's great. So I was so excited. Oh my gosh, so how do I get better? And that was the big gap I found is there wasn't really much about how do I get better at facing uncertainty? So what we did is we, of course, went back to whenever there was empirical research, we, we used that, but often there wasn't empirical research. So what we did is we interviewed innovators, you know, scientists who create breakthroughs, Nobel Prize winners, and in the process, we discovered there were many other people who learned to face uncertainty, not just innovators and CEOs who lead big change or Nobel Prize winning scientists, but you know what? Paramedics actually face a lot of uncertainty. Whenever they go through a door, they never know what they'll find. And so do gamblers and surfers and dyslexics and you know startup entrepreneurs. And we realized we can learn from them as well. So we went out, we interviewed, we gathered stories and... Um, you know, what we came up with a framework that we think is helpful. Uh, and you know, Sam Yegan was the CEO of Match.com. They're the dating website when they disrupted themselves with Tinder. And Tinder is a very well-known dating app. But that was a huge change for that company. And, you know, he looked back on that and he said, you know, the single biggest predictor of executive success is how you deal with ambiguity. And um, so this is an important topic, I believe, for, for all people. So the framework we came up with, and again, it's a mix of different types of evidence, is, is fairly simple. It is, number one, any possibility that you care about 
you had to first go through uncertainty to, to get it. Think about it. The things that you really care about, the things you're proud about, you had to go through uncertainty to achieve that thing. And that is true of the possibilities that we most admire, the breakthroughs we most admire. Those people had to go through significant uncertainty to achieve that thing. In addition, although uncertainty also happens to us, it's not just what we choose. Uncertainty happens to us and it feels, it feel, makes us feel anxious and it feels turbulent. There is always possibility hidden within it and or waiting uh, in the wings. And I, I, you know, hopefully I don't, uh, you know, uh, create any uh, contention here. You know, I know Italy is, uh, you know, unified country, but, you know, only only in the last, you know, 150 years or so. Uh, but I visited Venice and I was reminded of the possibility hidden inside uncertainty because, you know, people from all over the world come to admire this architectural gem. And what they forget is that it is the byproduct of 300 years of uncertainty as the the folks who lived on land there were constantly being attacked by invaders they went out into the lagoon and built this incredible thing developed both the sea power but then also the architecture that we admire today so in every uncertainty there's some possibility hidden in it if we can find it and the great news is there are tools and we thought you know what would be an interesting metaphor for this we said what about the first aid cross uh, which is this universal symbol of health. So we're going to talk about the first aid cross for uncertainty, the tools. We organize them around the four arms of this uh, first aid cross. The first thing, and these are the four things I'm going to want you to remember, is number one, it's reframing how you see uncertainty. We use the symbol of the North Star, this guide for your journey, is you can prepare for uncertainty. And we use the symbol of the backpack of how you prime and prepare for uncertainty. It's also about how you take action, how you do under uncertainty. And the image here is the train with the energy of a train leaving the station. And then lastly, you need to sustain yourself because uncertainty brings up about these challenging emotions and reactions. And for that, because I live in the city of Paris, I use the coat of arms of the city of Paris, which is a boat on turbulent water and the motto, tossed but not sinking. So let me... Um, walk you through these. I will uh, tell you that the reframe and sustain are more thinking oriented and the prime and do are more action oriented. So let's get into the first thing I want you to remember about facing uncertainty is the power of reframing it from something terrifying to as a source of opportunity. Now you may say, oh, Nathan, that's nice, but actually framing has deep roots. So Kahneman and Tversky won the Nobel Prize for their work on framing. They showed that how you describe something changes how you think about it, how you decide, and how you act. And, and their famous study, Simplified, they gave people two treatments for a disease. It was actually an Asian disease. Um, and they said, you know, one treatment has essentially a 5% chance of failure and the other a 95% chance of success. And you know what? People prefer a 95% chance of success because we are gain seeking. We like to win. We like to get more and we're afraid of loss. And that's the challenge with uncertainty is if we frame it as loss, which we often do, we become afraid of it and we become very tentative. Whereas if we see it as a source of opportunity, we uh, are more likely to take positive action. Now, this is, you know, not just some nerdy effect. This is something that has been used, for example, to pass on credit card fees to you and me. Uh, there's a famous example in the U.S. where they uh, used a framing trick. So they used to have an inheritance tax. And for years, one political party tried to get rid of it and could never succeed until finally they framed it as a death tax. And when they did that, nobody wants to be taxed for dying, right? That's a loss. When they did that, they were able to uh, get rid of the tax. So again, framing is something happening all around you. And it's how do we apply that? How do we change it? And one way to think about framing, uh, again, there's a long list of tools in the book. I'm going to give you a very narrow selection, is to think about what is a frontier? 
A frontier we often think of as a distant space, a faraway place, the edge. And we're kind of naturally scared of frontiers. We kind of want to stay back where it's a little safer. But in fact, when you talk to innovators and entrepreneurs, they view frontiers very differently. And they actually don't see frontiers as something exotic and distant, and they don't see it as something scary. They see it as the source where they can do their best work. So the gentleman in the upper right is an entrepreneur. His name is David Hyatt. He created a very successful clothing brand. Excuse me. He had a long career in at, at one of the top advertising firms, then created his own clothing brand, sold it to one of the major retailers, Timberland, and decided, you know, I'm going to move out to the West Coast of the UK, kind of take it easy, raise my kids in a rural environment. And he gets out there and he's kind of, you know, in a very small town, 4,000 people. And he discovers that it was once, he's kind of thinking about what do I want to do next? And he discovers that this tiny town was once the jeans manufacturing capital of the UK. So they made jeans, tons of jeans there. And all those jobs had fled overseas for lower cost wages. And so now it was this very economically depressed town. And he gets this crazy idea. What if I could make jeans in this town and put these people back to work? Now, I have a little video of him talking about it. I don't know if my bandwidth will support it. So uh, Stefano, if it's not working, give me the thumbs down and I'll uh, skip through it. But I'll try to share it with you. I think I've always loved business. But I've always thought that business can do good. And I think I've always thought that a business could be a tool for some kind of change that you believed in. Back in 1986, I arrived on Paddington train station and I had to go looking for work. And I got a job in advertising at a place called Saatchi and Saatchi. But I decided to myself that actually I climbed the wrong mountain. It was a beautiful mountain, but it was the wrong mountain. That's why I quit London and uh, wanted to get back to Wales. And, and the way to do that was by actually starting my own businesses. I asked myself, what am I going to go and do now? What do I do well? What does this town do well? And actually the answer was, it made jeans. It was the biggest and best jeans factory in Britain, bar none. And uh, in 2001, those gates closed, but those makers still had all the skills. And for me, if we go out of this town making jeans again, and we get 400 people their jobs back, and we go and prove actually you can make in Britain, and you can do it really, really well, then we'll have done a really great job. I've never been into that thing of just like, let's build a business to make a ton of money. But I've been really driven by actually, let's go make a ton of change. Uh, and I guess that's what drives me. So when we talked to David Hyatt, he pointed out, I'm not afraid of uncertainty. I love uncertainty because you can only do your best work when you are at the frontier. You have to be at the frontier if you want to do something new. Now, I'm going to speak to you as friends and as individuals. I'll translate it for an organization setting, but my thesis is that we need to get good at navigating uncertainty ourselves to be able to lead others through it. So if we think about how to apply this at a personal level, just think for a moment. Are you on the frontier of your career, of your intellectual life, of your financial life, on your relationship life, your social life, your physical life, your geographic life? You don't need to be on the frontier, by the way, on everything, right? But if you took a brief moment and assessed my guess is that most of us are far back from the frontier on any one of these dimensions. And what could happen if we were willing to step onto that edge to explore? So when you go, you know, tonight, I think about that later on. And by the way, this applies to organizations too. So Hamilton Mann is the head of digital transformation and innovation at Talis. They're a very technical company. They create you know, applications for space and for Earth that are 
you know, very technically complex and require high performance and safety. But he's very clear to tell us that if we want to do something new, the number one rule is we have to take a risk. There's no innovation without risk. We authorize people to disobey. He's highlighting you have to step onto the frontier. So let's just apply that to an organization. Is your company on the frontier with your customers, with your product, with your thought leadership, with your employee relationship? I mean, I love that one because, you know, to be honest with you, I think there are many companies where employees kind of hate the company. Somewhere in their heart, they wish it would fail. They don't want it to because they don't want to have to look for a new job. But that's not being on the frontier of the employee relationship compared to, say, a company like Patagonia, where people love that company and will give anything for it. So it's an interesting question. Again, we don't have to be on every frontier, but where could we do our best work if we were willing to step onto one frontier? So again, reframing, the first thing I want you to remember is reframing uncertainty from something scary where you're gonna lose to something where you can gain, where there's an opportunity there. Now, the second thing I want you to remember is you can prepare for uncertainty so that you behave better when you face it. Uh, and one of the ideas is to know your risks. What do I mean by that? This is actually a personal experience. When I was at Stanford, one of my mentors was Dr. Tina Selig. And I was a PhD student. Uh, again, I worked first, so I had kids. I had these four little kids. I was living on campus. We had no money. And yet I was an academic and you have to know that in Silicon Valley, the heroes are not professors. The heroes are the entrepreneurs. And uh, Tina and I went to lunch and I was kind of uh, sad. I was complaining to her. I was saying, you know, Tina, if I had any courage, I would go and be an entrepreneur, but I'm just not a risk taker. She said, wait a minute. What do you mean you're not a risk taker? I said, yeah, I just can't take the risk, the plunge to go be an entrepreneur. She said, wait, wait, wait. Do you think there's only one type of risk? No, there's financial risk, social risk, intellectual risk, uh, emotional risk. We could go on, right? You, Nathan, are, are, you are risk averse when it comes to financial risk. And I'm glad you've got four little kids who depend on you. But you're someone who's willing to take an intellectual risk, a social risk. So maybe being a professor is exactly the right job for you. And what Tina was trying to teach me is that if we understand our natural risk aversions and affinities, we can fortify where we feel an aversion. So we're well prepared to take a risk and we can, we should probably assess where we have an affinity and be embrace those areas. So for me, if I had gone and been an entrepreneur at that time, my risk aversion probably would have led me to do some counterproductive things. I would have been too frantic. But, you know, once I was able to be a professor and receive a paycheck, then I could take the intellectual and social risks that I have an affinity for. Now, uh, you can, uh, one of the tools uh, I'll, I'll share with you afterwards is you can actually map uh, where you have an affinity. So, um, this is a riskometer. It's actually a tool Tina came up with, and she has you map out your financial, emotional, social, physical, intellectual, and, and political willingness to take risks. And uh, the, the big thing is that, you know, you should ask yourself, am I playing to my affinities? Am I taking advantage of those? And But I would also ask, where is an aversion holding me back? So remember I told you about my financial risk aversion. Sometimes our risk aversions can hold us back from the things that are most important to you. I learned this from another mentor at Stanford, Bob Sutton, who one day in class announced to us that, you know, us poor PhD students, we were all bringing, you know, sandwiches from home to save money and trying to save, you know, every dollar, uh, every quarter, every nickel. and. He said, oh yeah, when I was a PhD student, I took out a $30,000 loan to finish my research. 
And it like blew the top off of her mind. What? You borrowed thirty thousand dollars to, you know, hire people to help you do your research. And he said, yeah, he said, I knew that my research was the thing that would help me get a great job and keep that job. And by the way, he's a tenured professor at Stanford today. He said, so why not spend some money on it? And it, it, my mind opened up. I realized how my financial risk aversion was holding me back. And so as you think, at, look at the things that hold you back, you want to be very aware. Now, the good news is you can improve your risk tolerance by taking small risks. So if there's a particular area of aversion that's holding you back, taking small risks can help you learn that it's not as scary as you imagine it to be. So again, you can apply this uh, at an individual level, uh, map out on a scale from say zero to 10, but you could apply it to an organization too. So what is your organization's financial uh, risk tolerance and operational and development and sales and legal and human resources? And you might say, oh, does that really matter? Well, let me give you an example. And this is a real example. Uh, a manufacturer in Europe who manufactured for 100 top brands, companies like Patagonia, who I mentioned, they needed to double their production. They had a campus. They leased some of that campus space externally. Their financial risk tolerance was so low that they delayed terminating those leases for risk of not getting paid so long that they have people hired and nowhere to work leading to major delays for these high-end clients who are frustrated. All of that came out of financial risk aversion. By contrast, on the right-hand side, a designer for a top brand, he actually hires people specifically who are tolerant of uncertainty. He encourages them to debate and to take smart risks. And he says to his team, I want your favorite color to be gray because it can be any color. They have had a 3x increase in their turnover in nine years and a nearly 18% compound annual growth rate in a very crowded industry. So these things can matter. So if we had more time, I would have you do a breakout. We don't. But my breakout for you tonight is to, you know, kind of take a moment to reflect on your risk tolerances and maybe on your organizational risk toler tolerances as well. We'll share these slides with you. OK, so the second thing I want you to remember is you can prepare. And part of preparing is knowing your risks. Now, of course, there are other tools to help you prepare, and I encourage you to go to the website for that. The third thing I want you to remember is that you, as you, you can take action, you can move forward on uncertainty in different ways than maybe you've been trained. And the way I would have you think about it is to ask the question, how do I activate and unlock the uncertainty? rather than try to manage and control. I know this sounds very weird. I myself, when I would go out and I would interview uh, folks, uh, innovators, I would say, I want to talk about how to manage uncertainty. And they would say, well, I love the topic of uncertainty, but I don't like that word manage. And, and you know, if you think about it, we have a very deep uh, interest in control in the domain of management. How do we control production? How do we control education? How do we control risks? How do we eliminate risks? And, and there are times where that's appropriate. But for me, the light bulb went on when I read about a Brazilian architect, Roberto Burley Marx, when he visited Berlin. Now, Roberto Burley Marx had a profound influence on modern, modern architecture. He's kind of one of the great modern architects. And he was studying in Berlin, and he went to an exhibit at the uh, garden, the, the indoor greenhouse in, in Berlin, the horticultural garden. And they had an exhibit on these plants from his, home, his own country. And what he noticed is he saw these brilliantly colored tattoo flowers and this incredibly beautiful snake wood. And these powerful plants were breaking out of the pots in which they had been planted. And he said to himself, what if rather than trying to control these powerful things, what if the question is, how do we activate and unlock them? And he went on, by the way, his style of architecture was to try to activate and unlock. So here's the Copacabana boardwalk, and you see these undulating patterns of stone. Here it is up from higher above. His whole 
thesis was how do I activate and unlock the power of what's already there? And we started to ask ourselves the question, what if there are some things that are better activated and unlocked? So Maria Montessori was the first female graduate from University of Rome. And she was uh, became very curious about children who had uh, mental learning challenges who had been assigned to asylums where they were controlled through medication. And she said, what if I created a learning experience that kind of activated their natural curiosity? And she went on to show that those children could pass uh, the standard state exams, and she developed a whole system of education that was about activating and unlocking children's natural curiosity, the Montessori education. She was honored as a Time Woman of the Year, and she, her response is, I didn't invent anything. I simply gave little children a chance to live. And then, you know, it's not just education. It's also Valve. Uh, software is this very interesting company. They, um, they were founded uh, to, with a very unique motto, and that was, we're not going to give people job titles. We're not going to tell them what to do. We're going to give them desks with wheels on it and say, move it to where you create the most value for for, for customers. So totally self-organizing, totally self-motivated. They've had incredible success. They've, you know, they own the platform through which most PC games are delivered. They have had, and, and they are some of the most prominent players in virtual reality. And their motto was, hey, we spent the last decade going out of our way to recruit some of the most intelligent, innovative people on earth, telling them to sit at a desk and do what they're told obliterates most of that value. And so it, they asked the question, how do we activate and unlock the intelligence and value of the people we lead? And you know what? It's the same story behind ING's uh, transformation. I, I don't have the time to go through it, so I'll skip through it. But again, how do we activate and unlock? At same thing, we look at high-end cuisine. They actually, the teams that do the R&D to like lead that high-end cuisine, try to actually inject uncertainty into it. And keep things open, trying to activate and unlock the curiosity and creativity of the people who are already there. So in taking action, there are a whole nother set of tools. I wish I had time to share with you, but let me just tell you the, you know, as you take action, ask, how do I activate and unlock the potential that's here rather than trying to control it down and squish it down? And uh, the fourth thing I would have you remember is that you need to sustain yourself and those you lead as you enter uncertainty because it's hard, it's frightening. And remember that motto uh, on the coat of arms, tossed but not sinking. Yes, you feel the turbulence, but you're not gonna sink. And one of the tools to deal with this, we learned from the gentleman who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry recently, Ben Feringa. He invented these little molecular machines, tiny little, um, molecules that can do things. Um, it, you know, when you read those science fiction stories about robots running around in your body, you know, fixing illnesses, it's based on his invention. And when I asked Ben Fringa about, hey, on the path to this breakthrough, did you face uncertainty? He's like, oh my gosh, yeah. And I said, how did you deal with it? And he said, if you deal with uncertainty, you will face frustration, you will fail. Allow yourself to feel the frustration for a few hours or a few days, but then ask yourself, what can I learn from it? What's the next step? What can I be working on? Get resilient at handling the frustration that comes with uncertainty. Now, it turns out he was using just one of several ways to view setbacks. So what do I learn from it? Another is, hey, life's a game. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It's all part of the game. Elon Musk explicitly referenced this frame in our interview with him. Another is to have gratitude for what you've had. So not about what you've lost, but what do you still have? Lou Gehrig was one of the great American baseball players when he got a crippling disease and he had to retire very quickly. And he gave this famous speech where he said, fans, for the past two weeks, you have been reading about the bad break I got. Yet today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. And so instead of focusing on the loss, focus on what you still have. Another is timing. It's just not the right time. And lastly is the values frame, which is 
viewing the challenge, the setback, as a chance to demonstrate your character. Again, I apologize for the speed of going through this, but you know, if in an organizational setting, you know, you we ask sometimes, you know, something goes wrong, we say, who's responsible? They're fired. Ben Fringa would never say that. And so there are ways we can apply these frames in organizations. Uh, what did we learn? Should we wait for later? We saw organizations using this as well. Unfortunately, uh, my time is short, and I want to remind you of the four key things. Number one, reframe uncertainty as something scary and something a source of loss to actually having possibility. Number two, prepare for it. Know yourself so that you can act with more courage and uh, integrity when you go into it. Number three, you can take action in small steps where you try to activate and unlock the possibilities that are there. And number four, sustain yourself. Again, you can find out more about it at uncertaintypossibility.com and another shameless call to action to pre-order it, basically because Amazon promotes the book based on how many pre-orders they get. So for me, it's not, I, I don't really make money off it. It's not about that. It's about the ability to go and write the next book because publishers only want to publish people whose books sell. So it's kind of the hard facts of life. Uh, if you have questions, you can reach out to me directly at INSEAD or look me up on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, next time I'm, I'm in Milan, maybe we can grab coffee.